Uh, panelists today kind of gave a, a couple of them away already. Uh, Jim Viola, our president and CEO, um, will be speaking here in just a few minutes. Chris Hill, our director of uh, safety, will be uh, joining us uh, a little later in the webinar to help moderate the question and answer uh, session for this one. We have a great list of panelists today. Uh, Chris Bauer is the president and CEO of Hughes Aerospace Corp. He's a retired military aviator. He's a dual rated ATP with more than 40 years of experience in aviation, including active involvement in the FAA's next gen in, uh, implementation and the global performance based navigation uh, or PBN movement. <coughs> uh, Brian Burby, Barabee, excuse me, is, uh, works with Chris. He's the chief designer for Hughes Aerospace Corp. His experience includes work uh, as an air traffic controller uh, with the US Air Force and uh, as a TERPS, a terminal instrument procedure specialist with the FAA. We have Nolan Crawford, who's an aviation safety inspector at the FAA, responsible for improving flight uh, operations, standardization, and then aviation safety through supporting the FAA's next generation program. <clears throat> Our final panelist today is Max Gornish. Uh, he is the business and commercial aviation sales manager at Garmin. Since joining the firm in 2011, he has worked as a technical lead on the ARINC production team and has played a significant role in expanding the database and capabilities of navigation data provider AeroNav Data. Um, our webinars are, are excuse me, uh, interactive. We do ask that you uh, submit questions so we can uh, work with you to get some answers. Uh, following the presentations is when the Q&A session will be held. Best way to ask questions is uh, using the uh, question module at the bottom of your screen or possibly at the side of your screen. Uh, we will try to follow all the questions um, or get all the questions we can. If you use the chat feature, that's fine. It's everybody's gonna be able to see that. Uh, we can't guarantee you we're going to be able to get all the questions from the chat feature. So please try to get the ones uh, into the question module. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will make this recording available online and we should be able to share the uh, link with everybody. Um, knowing that uh, a lot of accidents are uh, involving IFR situations, we ask that you share the uh, video with anybody that you know who is not able to uh, see this today. Now I'd like to uh, ask Jim Viola to turn his camera back on and uh, join us uh, for this part of the presentation. Thanks, Dan. Uh, you know, helicopter flight has been around for decades, and yet, you know, pilots in our industry continue to make some of the very same mistakes. One of the most common still is that helicopter pilots encounter has been, and it still is, you know, even as, you know, a couple of weeks ago in New York City is weather. I don't care where you are, weather can change quite rapidly. And, and I know that because it has on me in the past. And this is true uh, even more now as climate patterns are changing globally. So this is an international problem. It's not just a regional problem of VFR conditions turning IMC. So when all of the weather radars, the weather cameras that are out there, and we put more out there so you know they can help make those decisions for you, and the advanced weather forecasting tools are available and they continue to get better, pilots still find themselves entering IMC conditions. And they normally, when that happens, if they're not uh, pro properly prepared for that transition, those are the ones that don't make it back. So there are reasons, some will call them excuses, for continuing to fly into IFR conditions or when pilots should have stopped that flight and went with the HAI program of land and lit. Most though do survive and, and even more, we're hearing more reports of people who are surviving without a good plan, but it's depending on their training, their past training, uh, but tragically, there are those that should not enter at all because the aircraft and their training as well are not up to par. So if you haven't seen our 56 seconds to live safety program and video, I encourage you to take time to come to the website and watch those videos. We hope you find different points in your aeronautical decision-making process where opportunities exist as they do every day before you go flying while you're flying to make the correct decision to halt a flight before it ends badly. So what makes the difference between those who survive and who doesn't? One of the smartest decisions a pilot can make is to properly plan for weather before you ever encounter it. Quite honestly, I thank you because most of you are watching this presentation live or watching the recording because you want that information, you want that education. Our team of panelists today are here to help you prepare for IMC conditions and survive. As always, 
I encourage you to share this video with pilots who aren't here today, and we can work together to stop one of the most common causes of helicopter accidents. And I appreciate that you have taken the time to attend this presentation and or watch the video. So Dan, back to you and our great panelists. Thank you, Jim, appreciate your time today. I'd now like to uh, invite uh, Chris Bauer and uh, Brian Barabee to uh, join us uh, for their presentation. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Hughes, we'd like to express our condolences to, to Harold's family and uh, the family at HAI and his friends, a tremendous loss. And, um, and also thank Dan, Jim, and Chris for putting the webinar together along with our panelists. Um, Nolan Crawford and Max Gornish. So I'll start off by saying um, you know, today's panel isn't about, hey, you should be doing this or you should be doing that. Um, and, and in my, my 40 years of flying, I could tell you that I've done everything wrong that you could do and somehow managed to live. And the message is that we all, we're all human. We go out there and, and we make mistakes. And you know, if you learn from them, um, you can build a better mousetrap. And that, that better mousetrap is uh, the ability to safely fly in an all weather day night environment. And IFR for helicopters, particularly under next gen, and, and given the FAA's leadership in this space, um, is something to take advantage of. Um, Dan, if we get the next slide. There we go. So, um, for those of you who flew in the military, you know, first we got to tell you what we're going to do, then we're going to tell you how we're going to do it, and then we're going to tell you how we did it. So the first slide is what we're going to talk about today, at least from the Hughes perspective. Um, we'll have a brief overview of copter criteria and the safety benefits, talk a little bit about helicopter modernization. No one will cover some of that from an FAA perspective, and we'll cover it from a Hughes perspective. Uh, what the current challenges are, and I, I just picked one because we have limitations on time. Uh, talk a little bit about weather that uh, Jim Viola talked mentioned as to what the challenges are there and what's coming out that, that can improve that. And then and a very special feature with our chief designer, Brian Barabee, to talk about um, a chart clinic. And uh, it's not an all-encompassing, you know, we'll walk away and know everything about charting or how charts are made or what's behind the chart. But just to give you a, a, an overview, and Brian decided to drill down on uh, the differences between proceed visually, proceed VFR, and how that's evaluated and how that's captured onto a chart. You could have the next slide, please. So what's the biggest benefit of Copter IFR? And hands down, it's safety. It, it, if an aircraft is on an instrument flight plan, it's flying an instrument approach, um, you're not going to have a CFIT incident like you would trying to maintain VMC conditions and IFR conditions, where you have to fly lower and lower and lower. And I'll raise my hand and say I've, I've scud run uh, in my career, and it's not because I woke up that morning and decided, well, that's what I'm going to do. It's that I found myself in that situation. And, and because of that, one of my takeaways as a helicopter pilot was to get better at IFR instead of it being a weakness to make it a strength. So avoid flying low, slow, you know, where, where, where um, I'm, IFR means I follow roads. And that often leads to disaster where you contact things like wires, poles, buildings, and, and the like. Um, when you get into low visibility, it's a whole nother world. It's like flying with a refrigerator box over your head. You can't see much. You don't see things coming. Even if you're really familiar with the area, it looks a lot different when you're down into low visibility. Add to that flying at night or flying without a horizon. And um, it's a recipe for becoming disoriented and maybe losing control of the aircraft or, or having an accident. If, and certainly, if nothing else, uh, when you get back on the ground, you're like, why did I do that? You can leverage the benefits of contemporary avionics. And, and not to sound like the old guy in the room, you know, when I started flying, we had like, you know, no instruments in the helicopters or very, very uh, labor intensive to fly instruments. Uh, modern avionics today and auto flight systems give us the ability 
to leverage that into a lower workload environment. Well, the pilot isn't necessarily having to both fly the aircraft and manage the workload and the situation and the communications, but using autopilots, using glass, using databases um, and instrument approaches, moving map displays, um, electronic flight bags, you're able to manage the situation and monitor the performance of the aircraft and keep the aircraft in a safe um, flying envelope. In fact, one great takeaway is if the safe outcome of the flight is ever in question, then whatever you're doing, you should probably stop and get the aircraft out of that undesired aircraft state into a desired aircraft state. If that means climbing up, um, getting to a safe altitude, talking to uh, air traffic control, getting a clearance, wh whatever it is that gets you away from the ground. Um, all weather day night reliability is one of the tenants of copter IFR and in particularly uh, LPV approaches. LPV approaches essentially allows you to put an ILS type um, precision approach into a heliport or into a location where the pilot's going to have vertical guidance as opposed to dive and drive. Next slide, please. So here's a, a real world example. Um, Hughes had developed this approach. It's a copter instrument approach with both LP and LNAV minima. We'll talk about that in another slide about the, the differences. And uh, shortly after implementing this copter procedure at the Erlinger Medical Center, it was used um, on a patient flight and the pilot turned around, went back and took a picture of the aircraft. And it, to me, it's a success because it, everything happened. The safe outcome of the flight was never in question. The patient got to the, the hospital to get the treatment that they needed. And what you can't see in this background behind the helicopter is all of the terrain. If you look at the chart, you can see the terrain. But if you look at the picture, you just see gray. And I think it speaks to this type of deliberate, methodical flying that you can achieve with with copter instrument approaches. If you look on to the, the side of the slide here, I've got copter LNAV, copter LPV, copter LP, RNAV departures and airways. These are what's available in the copter IFR world, where you could have a basic lateral navigation procedure. And that basic LNAV procedure is a non-WASP procedure. So raw GPS is accurate to about 10 meters. When you can differentiate GPS or augment it, you could get it down to one to two centimeters of accuracy, and that would be a copter LPV or LP procedure. The LP, like the LNAV, is lateral guidance, but because of WAS, the containment comes down to one to two meters, so you pull in less obstacles, it gives you lower minimums on an approach. If you have an instrument approach to get in, you have a copter IFR departure to get out. And then to connect all this into a network, there's airways. We're all familiar with Victor Airways, low altitude airways. I don't think we have copters yet flying in the jet routes, so I won't bring up J routes. Um, TKs, which are the FAA's moniker for a copter route and often used interchangeably with transitions. And ZK routes, which is something new that we work with the FAA on that uses WAS to create an RNP, required navigation performance, an RMP of value of 0.3, so that's three tenths of a mile. If you're new to the RMP world, it's coming. In fact, it's already here. We'll talk about that in a subsequent slide. And required navigation performance means that there's a 95% probability that the aircraft will remain within two times the RMP value. So the FAA tells us that the WASP constellation is 99.7% reliable and it provides an RNP containment of three tenths of a nautical mile or an RNP of 0.3. And that's why that's important. So when you get into a ZK route, you can get closer to the ground, stay out of icing, closer to obstacles, and you only need 1.2 nautical miles of airspace to create that route, as opposed to what you would need for conventional airway, which is um, eight miles. Next slide, please. So how do we build a, a copter procedure into a heliport? And there's a lot of science behind it, um, particularly at, at Hughes and what we're doing in that we will go out to a heliport 
we take a theodolite, which if you look at the picture in the center is a camera image of a theodolite showing an eight to one slope um, from the heliport. And you're looking for obstacles that would penetrate that slope. And that's your ingress and egress, your eight to one. The other thing that we do, um, you look at the images, we launch a drone and we'll create a photo mosaic of the, the heliport area. And we can create from that a digital elevation model, which can be processed in our software. And we can look for penetrations in that eight to one slope. And if we can eliminate those penetrations and an expert like Brian can evaluate them down to the inch. So if there's a tree, you might see poking up in the slide in the, on the upper right corner, there's a tree coming through that slope. And we can determine that if they could remove three inches of tree, you would now have a eight to one that's clear for ingress and egress. Anything, Brian, you would touch on on this slide? I would say that um, the eight to one is, is the, the foundation of the visual transition um, along with the heliport infrastructure. Uh, the advisory circular is pretty specific about what's required to support a visual transition. And we'll, we'll talk about visual transitions uh, a little bit more in depth when we get to charts. Suffice it to say, the visual transition allows the aircraft to fly to the minimums that are on the chart, whereas a VFR transition could take the shape or form of many different things. Your uh, organization may have VFR minimums. You may use the uh, Part 135.613 uh, criteria for a VFR transition. It was really important that the green section in the upper right corner uh, picture is clear. That would be our eight to one. And in TERPS, it's rise over run. So it goes up eight feet for every one foot it goes away from the helipad. And that's the basic. So if we have a heliport that meets the design guide criteria for a visual transition, and then we evaluate our eight to one and it's clear, then we can proceed uh, with the understanding that we have a pretty good chance of developing a visual uh, transition, which is ultimately the money shot. Um, it would not be as advantageous to fly to VFR minimums uh, when really flying to visual minimums are, are preferred. Chris? Well, thanks, Brian. That, that, that's a good summation. Um, can we get the uh, next slide, Dan? So that teases up into proceed VFR versus proceed visually. What does that mean? And, and it, it, it's still, even experienced helicopter pilots have issues grappling with what proceed VFR and proceed visually means. What's on this slide is a chart um, that is a proceed visually uh, instrument departure, the burnt one. And um, to the right, in a smaller graphic is a proceed VFR departure which is the sickle one. So in a proceed VFR situation, there's no weather minimums on that chart for that departure. And the reason is it depends on what's in your op spec. What, what does your op spec delineate as proceed VFR? Those are your weather minimums. Proceed visually, you'll see charted weather minimums because that is what's prescriptive for that particular approach because proceed visually is actually an instrument maneuver. No different than if you were going to an airport and the controller asked you if you could see the airport. Let's say you were flying a helicopter and you're gonna land at the GAT in Kennedy and they said, report the GAT in sight. Report, um, there's an American 737, you know, you see him, you know, call that, call that traffic in sight. Once you call that traffic in sight, you're proceeding visually. But it doesn't mean that you're VFR. It means that you're still on an IFR flight plan, but you're providing your own separation from traffic and you're maintaining VMC conditions. And if you were to go around or whatever, you would still be an instrument target to the controller. And that's what's going on here at the heliport with this copter departure or copter approach with proceed VFR and proceed visually. We're advocating to the FAA, hence the... Uh, um, 
to update the criteria they currently have, and we're working with them to do just that, to lower the departure minimums to avail ourselves of RMP APCH and RMP.3, which provides greater accuracy in the avionics. The criteria that was written for this was long, long ago, and maybe Nolan might touch on that in his, in his discussion. But I'd like to flip it over to Brian because he could give you maybe a little bit more depth on proceed visually and proceed VFR. Again, it comes back to the foundation. Uh, we can have a, a really great looking mansion, but if it's built on, on quicksand, it's not going to last. And the same thing is true about helicopter procedures. Where they terminate and where they originate um, really says a lot about what you can and can't do. Um, if we were to develop a procedure to a field, um, we wouldn't get very good minimums because it's an uncontrolled, unmaintained, uh, unprepared surface. There may not be any lights. There may be penetrations of the eight to one surface, uh, so on and so forth. If we have a helipad that was um, very thoughtfully put together, the operator had the right kind of uh, resources and uh, a mind to do so, he or she could develop a, a helipad that's going to support an IFR, or excuse me, a visual transition. So this is uh, the helipad at Metro Aviation in Shreveport. Uh, and this pad does support the visual transition. So the question is, well, why does this, the cycle one go VFR and the burnt one go visually? The burnt transition or the burnt procedure transitions to the north where I have a clear eight to one. Fortunately, the eight to one doesn't have to encompass the whole helipad. It needs to encompass 17 degrees, or excuse me, six degrees either side of your departure course. There's another visual assessment surface that we uh, use also. It splays at 17 degrees either side of that approach uh, or that uh, departure course. Uh, then you can proceed via uh, visually. The cycle goes in a completely different direction. It goes towards the east near uh, Barksdale Air Force Base. And in that direction, there isn't a clear eight to one, but the operator um, wanted to have the option of departing IFR once the aircraft reached its first fix uh, to the east. Um, the burnt is the reciprocal of the approach into the helipad. So it's a, it's a, pretty, easy, uh, a pretty easy shot to go back out the way you come in. But there are many times where going out the way you came in puts you into a tailwind. And we have location in San Antonio where we know the wind primarily comes from the south. So we depart to the south. We're not limited to strictly going back out the way we came in. There may be uh, times where it's operationally advantageous for instance, you have a clear eight to one in one direction, you're gonna go in and out that way. Chris? Thanks, Brian. So let's go to the next slide. And this is a this is a good this is a good Brian slide where he can show you maybe from an engineering analysis as a Terps engineer, how this this bulb, we'll call it, is evaluated at the heliport. So this is a criteria that has been around since 2012. Prior to that, there was no IFR helicopter criteria for departures. Um, when I worked for the FAA, the Army had a carve out for um, departures, but there was no public, publicly uh, produced uh, criteria for departures. And in 2012, uh, the FAA came out with a couple of things. Number one was copter LPV um, and also copter departures. So the infamous bulb is the circular shaped uh, construction around the waypoint telia. And that's an eighth of a nautical mile centered on that waypoint. And the current criteria says that you're going to evaluate the tallest obstacle inside of there. And there may not be a real obstacle. There may not be a telephone pole or a building, 
but we're going to assume an obstacle. Uh, when cell towers started going up all over the place, the FCC requires cell towers to be registered, but the FAA does not, so long as they don't exceed 200 feet AGL. So as a failsafe, we assume an adverse obstacle of 200 feet, and we plant that obstacle on the highest terrain in that segment. And because we're using an altimeter that's used, using uh, uh, the barometer, we have a required obstacle clearance of 250 feet. So this is a flat surface and nothing can penetrate that. So if you had an obstacle of 200 feet and you had to put 250 feet on it, then your altitude within that flat surface inside the bulb would be 450 feet. And we have to round up to the nearest 20. So now it's 460 feet. Let's say I'm heavy with fuel and patience and I can't lift off my helipad and make that climb from the helipad to tell you. Um, so now you have to depart VFR and maybe that doesn't get it done because you're, you're not in VFR, uh, VMC conditions. So what we've uh, been able to work with the FAA on is the description on the left. It's a, a little bit closer version of the waypoint and the helipad and the bulb. And it's got three different surfaces. The green surface is the eight to one surface. The purple surface is called OCS one and OCS two, obstacle clearance surface one and two. And that's our visual assessment area. And then the blue triangle is called the obstacle identification surface. And we have a big tower that's right off of the helipad. This is the Ross County, uh, or the, uh, the Ross County barracks for the state police in Ohio. They have a really big tower that holds their antenna. And the hospital helipad is pretty close to that tower. So what we've been able to do under current criteria is apply for a waiver uh, to the bulb, because if we just followed the bulb and we followed the uh, current criteria, the aircraft wouldn't be able to depart in this direction um, because it couldn't climb over that obstacle in the, in the space that it has. So we've petitioned the FAA through a waiver process to say, hey, look, we have a clear eight to one. We have a clear visual assessment area and in our visual identification surface, we found an obstacle. So we're gonna do several things. Number one, we're gonna tell the aircraft to depart on a track to cross Telia at whatever altitude is required. Number two, we're gonna chart that obstacle on the departure chart so that the operator is uh, aware of its, its location and, and where it is. And this works in some instances, and in some instances, it doesn't. Uh, we find oftentimes that obstacles that control the flat surface aren't in the direction of flight. They might be behind the helipad. They may be way, way over to the right side of the bulb, and the aircraft is gonna fly directly from the helipad to the waypoint. So to further on Chris's, uh, comment about working with the FAA for new criteria, we're proposing to get rid of the bulb. If your VFR and your helipad doesn't support a visual transition, then we're not gonna have a bulb. The aircraft is gonna maneuver however it needs to maneuver to get to Telia. And from Telia, the surface would be sloped. So the containment, which is uh, on the right side again, we have the, uh, the lines moving perpendicular to the edge of the bulb. Those are our primary and secondary areas associated with the RNP. We're gonna extend those to the, alert, the early along track tolerance, which is the red circle around Telia. And from there, create a slope. And that slope is 20 to one. It equates to about 400 feet per nautical mile. And then based on what the aircraft will experience in the IFR portion of this departure, we'll set a minimum altitude to cross Telia. If the aircraft 
can depart that helipad visually than the construction that we see on the left with the, the green, the purple, and the blue will be put in place. And the aircraft can track to that using the minimums associated with the departure, which in many cases could be 300 and three quarters versus say 600 and three quarters. That's, uh, that's some down in the weeds stuff, but these are the kinds of things that go into developing a Turks procedure. Now, this is just a departure. The approach is uh, just the same. Um, for a visual transition to a helipad, we still look at those very same surfaces. They may be slightly different in geometry, but they serve the same purpose. Chris? Thanks, Brian. So I think for, for the audience, when you look at a chart, some people feel when they have an instrument approach that they're getting a chart, but it, the chart is just representing the science and the engineering effort that's behind the interpretation of all of these surfaces, all of these obstacles, the terrain, and what gives you the pilot, the, the comfort of knowing that when you're on this procedure, that you're gonna be clear of all of these uh, penetrations. Next slide, Dan. So I'll take a segue, a, a little bit of an off ramp here. One of our current challenges, we're talking about departures, that Hughes has identified and is also working with the FAA on is, um, I'll just call it the Nasser exclusion. So if, if you've got a, a special instrument departure, which the vast majority of helicopter departures are, and if you use a contemporary electronic flight bag system, or you try to file through Litos or ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot, um, flightplan.com, you're gonna get an error message like you see on the screen here. It's not gonna be able to file that departure. It'll file the rest of it. And then there's a workaround. And the current workaround is that pilots are putting the waypoints in the flight plan um, as not a departure, but just a string of waypoints. And they're getting the clearance. The danger there is, um, if you get your clearance, you're not getting cleared for the departure unless it's so stated, otherwise you're being clear to waypoints. And that could put you below the TAA. The significance there is the FAA could come after you and take certificate action, or you could put the aircraft in a position where it may not have obstruction clearance. So we've been working with the FAA and advocating for the FAA to put special instrument departures in the NASA which is a file that's generated every 28 days. And that database file is where these electronic flight bags go to source your flight plans. And we're doing a, a trial right now, and the FAA has been very supportive of this, um, particularly AFS 420 and uh, Chicago Center uh, Airspace and Procedures. And one of the operators that we work with up there, um, OSF Aviation, has allowed, um, volunteered to be a guinea pig and we're looking at if we can't get it into the 28-day NASA, perhaps a separate standalone database that could be accessed by an EFB. So when you file for the Lears 1 departure, it'll find it, and then you'll get the Lears 1 departure. So in the meantime, before that happens, you can file the waypoints, but in the comments, you should put, this is for the Lears 1 departure. And when you get your clearance from air traffic, Make sure it's not just cleared as filed, but you make sure you hear the word, I'm cleared to fly the Lears 1 departure in this case, as an example. So it's just something we wanted to bring your attention to. It's something that, again, we're working collaboratively with the FAA and, uh, and, and operators that are, uh, are Hughes customers and, and not Hughes customers to resolve. Next, next slide, Dan. So talking about copter modernization, um, ZK routes. We touched on it earlier in the presentation. This is an example of a ZK route as you would see it on an EFB. In this particular case, it's for flight. And um, you can see the own ship display of the helicopter on there, um, along with this ZK route that I'm flying. And this is in mountainous terrain um, between Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, I think I did this one back in, uh, in the wintertime. So what's nice about the ZK route 
is it only requires the 1.2 nautical miles of airspace and they're dedicated airways. They're not a transition. They're a line selectable um, airway. In fact, Max might, might touch on how, how that all goes into a database. So as a pilot, you can just pull it up. Um, you can operate closer to the ground because the accuracy, we were talking before, you have eight miles of airspace for uh, a legacy airway. If you go to a transition route, like a TK route, you're looking at about four to six miles of airspace. This, this ZK route or WAS enabled RMP um, will get you down to three tenths of a mile. So blowing that out times four, the requirement would be for 1.2 nautical miles of airspace. So not only does that help you in areas of terrain, but it also helps you in areas where you have congestion, where you can get more direct routings because we don't have to tie up or seek eight miles of airspace we may not get. We could have a better shot at getting 1.2 nautical miles of airspace. And when we talk about RMP APCH, which is the new designation for approaches and using WAS, this all ties together into an an architecture, an ecosystem, a network, if you will, of RMP.3 throughout. So no matter where you are in the service area, whether you're on a route, you're on an approach, you're on a departure, you're always getting this 0.3 required navigation performance containment. And, and there's that 95% probability that you're within two times RMP or six tenths of a mile. And prior to the advent of, of wide area augmentation or space-based augmentation, um, none of this was really possible. One, one note uh, that I'll talk about at, at the end of the slide here is if your current op spec is H122, to avail yourself of RMP, APCH, and copter airways and departures, um, it requires an update to the H123 op spec. Next, uh, next slide, Jim. So this is an example of an, an instrument approach, copter instrument approach, and in, in, in a couple of things that you're seeing on this slide, radius to fixed turns or RF. You, you're probably starting to hear that more and more in discussions about instrument approaches with seeing it on charts, hearing it in the hangar, you know, what's RF? Well, it's radius to fix, it's, it's a curved path that can either be straight and level or you could climb or descend on it. It's extremely accurate in the sense of air encoding that tells the flight management computer, whether that's a GTN 650 or um, a 750, a G1000 cockpit, depending on what kind of avionics are in your helicopter. If it's a contemporary suite, it'll support this radius to fix turn. That allows us to go around obstacles and terrain and airspace as opposed to having to dive and drive over the top of it. We can go around it and with great accuracy. There's an approach here in Matagorda Regional Medical Center. And um, you can see the RF segment, which is this turn right before the, the final approach fix. And you'll also see this is taken from the, uh, the Hughes app so the other advent recently is own ship display. So you can have, and you can see this red, this red triangle with the ring around it. So this was actually taken in the aircraft on the approach where I took a screenshot of the, in, in the Hughes app of this approach plate, and you can see own ship display on it. One of the benefits of own ship display, particularly for single pilot IFR, is if you've got the nav system coupled up and you're flying it on the autopilot um, and you look at the chart and the chart should match where you think you are as to where you actually are. And it's just like having another set of eyes in the cockpit with you. And if they don't match, that might be a good time to climb up to a safe altitude and figure out what's not right, what's not engaged, or what isn't, what isn't set right. Um, and I also wanted to show you what that looks like on the avionics is radius to fixed turn. Um, this is just a screenshot from our, the one that's in our helicopter, and you can see the magenta line and how it arcs um, to the left. Next slide. This is a departure with a radius to fix segment. The benefit there is not having to fly unnecessary track miles. 
And unless helicopters, you know, since I've been flying them, they've always been fuel critical as soon as you start the engine. Um, you're usually wanting to maximize the efficiency of the aircraft. And the other problem with helicopters oftentimes is noise complaints or visual noise or don't fly over my, my house or this area. So with radius to fixed turns, we can tailor the ground track of the aircraft to its most favorable and most efficient flight path. And you can see, I took a screenshot of the, uh, the Garmin. This is uh, Aspen glass that's in our helicopter. And you can see the bank angle on this is, is, is fairly benign. It's um, about seven degrees. And you can see the wind. Right now we're on this radius to fix turn. Um, and the wind is out of the west. It's a crosswind of 25 knots. And the cross track error is only uh, 0, 0.0. So again, that great containment of being exactly where you want to be, regardless of what the wind's doing, whatever your airspeed is, um, you're going to navigate with a lot more um, efficiency. Next slide. I'll let Brian speak to this. This is part of our chart clinic. So what I wanted to do is give you a couple of different uh, examples of charting uh, products that are out there. Um, the non-FAA service providers have a, an obligation to follow a standard format. It doesn't have to be Jefferson or somebody like that, but it has to be recognizable. Um, and the FAA has eight different volumes of uh, charting directive, if you will, what's appropriate for font size, font type, so much, what, what's going to be depicted and how is it going to be depicted? And so I wanted to look at a couple of non-Hughes charts and just point out some things um, that may be different um, for a proprietary chart versus an FAA produced chart. If we start in the upper left-hand corner, and by the way, both of these approaches support LNAV uh, minima only, just azimuth with no uh, vertical guidance. Um, so you have an approach course. There's no WAS information here uh, because there's no WAS, WAS component. Uh, in the case of uh, Copter 291 at Indianapolis downtown, you have an airport elevation, but no runway and no touchdown. The airport elevation may or may not be um, a factor in how your minimums are being uh, calculated. I don't want to jump around too much, but if we took that 732 feet for airport elevation and then we look down at the bottom of the chart where the minimums are, we have 1340 and three quarters of a mile with 1340. So I would ask, how high am I above the ground? Or how high am I above? What was this minimum based on? Uh, this is a, a basic question that I would ask as a pilot. What, is, what are these minimums based on? Um, another uh, point out here would be um, proceed VFR. If we read our, um, read our notes, it's a proceed VFR from OPNIC or conduct the specified missed approach. And there we see our surface elevation of 824 feet. So the surface is an evaluation of the terrain, 5,200 feet around the final fix. In this point, it would be OPNIC. And the highest terrain is, is uh, derived, and then the minimums are based on that. You can see the helipad, uh, excuse me, the helipad elevation is less than that. I'm still not sure how 1340 and 1340 were derived from 824 feet, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Another thing I wanna point is three quarters of a mile visibility preceding VFR. In today's contemporary criteria, I'm bound to chart a visibility minimum based on the distance between the missed approach point and the heliport. And if we look in the circular blow up here, um, it says our heliport is on a heading of 336 for 4.2 miles from OPNIC. 
Um, another question I would ask is, what's the three quarters of a mile based on? Um, some of the um, particulars about these, uh, these procedures is that um, they're only VFR uh, transitions. In most cases, and I won't say in all cases, but in most cases, FAA procedures are going to be a VFR transition. Um, I don't believe, although I know it's in the works, that there are survey standards for um, helipads, VFR helipads specifically. And so without solid survey data, the FAA opts to provide uh, the most protection possible, which is to have the aircraft proceed VFR rather than assuming a clear eight to one surface. Some things that you see on the chart in Indianapolis, you don't see on the chart in the Southampton on the right. Here uh, on the Southampton approach, we have what's called the PBN box. And that's at the very top in the briefing strip when it says RNP approach. As Chris alluded to, this is a harmonization with ICAO. For many, many years, people would get RNP confused with RNPAR which is uh, a slightly different animal than RNP. RNP simply means that it, there's a required navigation performance. It doesn't mean that it's going to be something that you have to have a special aircraft certification and pilot training in order to fly. This lets the pilot know that this procedure was based on RNP approach, and that basically equates to uh, the point three on RNP. This one does have a surface elevation of 39 feet and an airport elevation of five feet, yet it will still use a VFR transition uh, from the waypoint CRAN to the helipad. This one has uh, 560 foot minimums with a 521 has, and that 521 plus your surface elevation of 39 gives you 560. So on the Southampton procedure, it's pretty easy to figure out what the minimums were based on. This uh, procedure has uh, visibility minimums of one, and that is based on the fact that if we look in our little inset here to the right, we're on a heading of 197.9 nautical miles from the missed approach point. Truly, we should look and see what the, uh, statute mile would be how that equates to 0.9 nautical miles, maybe a little bit more than the mile statute mile. Next slide, please. So the Hughes charts follow a fairly, uh, fairly uh, to the, uh, close to what uh, the FAA charts are, uh, are doing. Um, depending on the terrain that we're in, we may add uh, terrain, uh, colored terrain. There are some that we may add just contour lines to give um, the operator, the pilot, um, some spatial awareness of, of what the terrain may look like that he or she is flying into. The uh, copter, the PAPA version of the uh, copter 139 into Metro is WAS. Um, since they're both copter RNAV 139, we have to differentiate them somehow. So, we use, use uh, the PAPA designation for the LPV guidance. We use the mic identification for LNAV only guidance. So the charts look fairly the same. The waypoints are all the same. The inbound courses are all the same. Uh, we do have a WASH channel up here in the top left-hand corner. We have our PBN box, RMP approach with the sensor GPS. This has a helipad elevation because it has a visual segment. So the minimums in the bottom here, 426, is 250 feet above the 176 of the helipad. And that gives us our uh, DA. And it's the same with the LNAV version, the mic, helipad elevation of 176. It's 484 feet above the helipad, which yields 660 for an MDA. The difference that uh, that most people see is the the uh, the MDA and the DA. 
In this, in this case, we're talking more than 200 feet. And that's really a product of the fact that the WASP procedure is much more narrow. Um, the LPV trapezoid, and that's, it is shaped as a trapezoid, uh, emulates that of an ILS trapezoid on a runway. Um, and that's what LPV stands for, uh, localizer uh, with vertically guided, localizer performance with vertical guidance. And it's much more narrow. So we don't pick up um, the same kind of obstacles that we may with the LNAV because it's 0.6 nautical miles either side of the center line. In addition, we have vertical guidance and we know that the aircraft's not gonna, not gonna drop, it's just going to fly that glide path. So there are many obstacles that we can overcome by flying on a vertically guided procedure rather than dropping down to a minimum altitude and staying above it um, like we do on the LNAV. The LNAV has a required obstacle clearance of 250 feet, just like the departure in the IDF in the bulb, uh, it has 250 feet and so it becomes a flat surface, whereas the LPV, you know, is a sloped surface. Another way to, uh, another reason this is differentiated between the M and the PAPA version is in the profile view. You have a little angle and uh, a description to the right of it. And we can see that in both of the profiles in both the MIC and the PAPA. So for the PAPA version, we can go from the DA to the helipad 10 feet above the helipad at an angle of 3.48 uh, degrees. On the mic, however, we don't have that same, uh, that, that same descent angle. Number one, we're gonna descend from a, a higher altitude. Number two, I have a much larger area I have to protect. And that means my visual area is bigger also. And these little red icons here in the bottom right helipad sketch are the reason that this is different. We're going to hold our altitude until we're beyond the missed approach point, and then we're going to descend to a different hover height. This will be at seven, almost seven and a half degrees, but it still provides that visual transition. I can't put both of those on the same chart. They would be conflicting. Uh, different, uh, different descent instruction and a different hover height are really the only reason that these two are split. Next slide. All right, Chris, this is you. All right, time for you to wake up again. Um, Come on now, this is fun stuff. I know it is, I know it is. So um, one of the other challenges for helicopter pilots is finding weather, good weather, weather sources. And we we worked with the FAA on a project many years ago involving weather cameras. We put a station in Southampton heliport along with AWOS and, and ADSB and some other features. And the, the biggest takeaway in terms of feedback we got from local pilots was they liked the cameras the best to try to figure out what the weather was doing. So the FAA is working with advisory weather cameras and they're making them available. Um, and Hughes has developed its own weather camera system and we're going to um, actually display it at uh, the next heli expo in dallas in march um, so aircraft coming to heli expo could actually use it um, as a safety feature to look at the weather um, and have a real-time understanding of what the weather's doing you know the bar to entry for awas threes and and the like uh, are very significant cost issues civil works issues um, to install them and maintain them that may be outside the capability of, of a lot of heliports. So the idea of this weather camera and advisory system is it's low cost, it's easy to install it, and um, it doesn't involve having to get a VHF frequency, um, it simply works on the internet. So either using something like the Hughes app or just an internet browser, you can go to the website here and you can pull up a camera and you could look in four cardinal directions. You could loop it back um, a number of hours and you could see the trend in the change in the weather um, along with the, the basic wind temperature dew point spread and altimeter. 
And you could click on those and also pull up graphs and trends over a period of time just to get a sense for is the weather coming in, is the weather going out, or is it stable? And then you could click on the image and get a clear day representation to compare to a present day, which will help you understand um, what you should be seeing and what might be covered up by obscuration. So uh, again, something that we're working on for our customers to have a better sense of the weather to tie into these instrument procedures that, that we've developed. And uh, next slide, please. And we put this into an app. Um, one of the things we realized from an SMS perspective was we didn't have great communication with the end state user, which is the pilot that's flying the approach. And he or she um, sees an obstacle. How would they get that information to us? So we created this app that's free um, and it has your special instrument approaches in it. It has your charts. It has own ship display, so you could use it. Um, you could also print charts from the app wirelessly. Um, you can submit safety reports. It has a theodolite built in. So if you see a crane or an obstacle pop up at your heliport, you can take a georeference picture of it, send it to us, and allow us to evaluate it. And it creates a record of that event. And, and it's just, it's feature rich, and I won't go into all the things you can do with it, but it, it grew into a, a really good communications tool for us and our customers to keep us surprised of things that, that are going on in their, uh, in their AOR. It also allows um, better visibility on NOTAMs when we issue a NOTAM, even though we issue an FAA NOTAM. Um, you may have missed it, just make sure that you don't. And it also has a thing in there where you can put your own NOTAM. So if you were, going to a heliport and you didn't want somebody to park there or you wanted to put what the combination was for the gate, um, you can put in your own NOTAMs into this app and take them and uh, include pictures as well. Next slide. So that's it for Hughes. Um, thank you, Dan, for, for uh, sequencing the slides for us. And um, I've been trying to answer some of the questions I've seen pop up, but uh, We'll, uh, we'll turn it over back to you and our other panelists. Okay, thanks, Chris, and thank you, Brian. Now yeah, that was a uh, that was that was a lot of information. Really appreciate uh, your presentation this afternoon. Uh, now, I'd like to uh, invite Nolan uh, Crawford to come on from the FAA. I will like to uh, do would like to alert our attendees. We are going to go long this evening. Um, this is a uh, an important discussion. There's a lot of information. And so we hope you can stay with us. If you can't stay with us tonight, we hope that you'll uh, be able to watch the video. All right, good afternoon, Dan. If you could bring up my slides, please. Okay, not a problem. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, while Dan's bringing those up, uh, we're gonna attack this a little bit different direction than Hughes did. Uh, they hit it more on the procedure side of it. What I'd like to do is talk to you about the helicopter uh, modernization team. It's a team made up of multiple um, FAA flight standards lines of business. Uh, in saying that though, we're also working cross lines of business with such folks as airports legal, uh, also working with some of our third party uh, developers such as Hughes and Hickok and working with our air traffic counterparts. Uh, the five people that are presently on the team are listed there below. Myself, who is the acting uh, leader of the team, uh, we just lost a, a great asset we had. Some of you guys may know Dante Fontenot was down in Baton Rouge for a while and then over in the flight procedures and airspace group for a while. We also have Mike Webb, who is in AFS 420. He's a uh, TERP specialist. Uh, Gerald Polly, also in AFS 420, is a TERP specialist. Tom Luperspeck is over in AFS 200. He's in the uh, 135 side of the, uh, of the helicopter world. And we have Eddie Miller who is over in the AFS 800 section. Next slide, please. All right, so our, our basic mission task is to bring the helicopter operations from the Huey 5808-6 world that we all knew many, many years ago 
to the modern side of it, the S92s, the AW139s, the S76s and things like that. Well, the only way we can meet what those aircraft have the capability of doing is to update and modernize the system. So what we're looking at doing is updating all of our ACs, our orders, our FARs, uh, and our authorization documents. And that's gonna be the direction that I kind of go to date is to one, tell uh, industry what we're doing, some of the changes that we've made, some of the changes that are in, in the works as we go, and also try to get some feedback via the question and answers, via the uh, just my contact information to say, hey, you know, this is where we're at. Where do you want to go? Because a lot of this is based on industry. What do you guys want to do? How far do you want to take the helicopter world? A joke, but I kind of mean it in a serious way. I look at that modern helicopter as doing the same thing that any modern business jet will do except it doesn't do three things. It doesn't go as high, it doesn't go as far, and it doesn't go as fast. But as far as the capability and the technologies, the modern helicopter has a lot of the same bells and whistles that you will see in a lot of the uh, new modern business jets. Next slide, please. So the purpose today is just to tell you the direction that the FAA is going right now and with the modernization team, some of the folks we're working with and some of the projects we're working. I would like to ask the community today, you know, what the helicopter needs, community needs are, and to give you some of the updates. Some of the uh, heliport evaluation changes that we are in the process of talking about, Brian was talking earlier about uh, heliport surveys. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll also talk about the 7480, which is the uh, notice of construction, alterations, deactivations of airports. Um, that way, if you see a new heliport coming up, or if you happen to be in the market to build a new uh, heliport, you'll understand some of the things we have to do. We'll brush on the special instrument procedure side of it. Didn't want to go in depth because you just had an awesome class from, from Brian and Chris on that. We'll talk about some of the orders and criteria that we are in the process of updating. And we'll talk about some of the roles and responsibilities of the uh, FAA. Next slide, please. So as far as the instrument world, many years ago, probably back about the early nineties, we started looking at what we can do for the helicopter world. Many of us had started years ago most of the aircraft back there were, were not instrument rated, so we transitioned from the VFR world to the IFR world at a very, very slow pace, a lot slower than our, our airplane counterparts in many, in many ways. The first thing that came out was the point in space proceed VFR procedure. A way to think about that is basically a procedure that you're allowed to get into the IFR world and you fly a procedure down to a missed approach point but then you have to have your VFR minimums, whether it be your OBSPEC or the regulation rules that, that have you have your minimums. From there, we progress to the point in space with the proceed visually. Again, I will not go back all over those because Brian and Chris did a very good job with those and willing to answer questions on it though during the uh, question and answer session. The, now we about, Four or five years ago, we transitioned to the TK routes, which is a helicopter specific route. And now we have since transitioned to special instrument procedure routes, we call SK routes. Those are based on RMP 0.3. And the next thing we're looking to do in criteria, and we'll talk about it as we go, is full IFR to and from the ground. Now, if you look at the bottom of the chart here, you'll see on the bottom left, it talks about minimum infrastructure. That would be associated with the point in space proceed VFR type procedures. If we go to the full IFR to and from the ground, that's gonna be your greatest infrastructure. So that could be more space, that could be more equipment, that could be more lighting, and, and a little bit of things in between there. The question that I'd like for you to ponder as we go through this seminar today is to tell us the FAA, where do you want to go? Is the point in space, VF, 
uh, perceived VFR good enough for you? Is the point in space perceived visually good enough for you? Or is it important enough to industry as a whole to go to the perceived uh, full IFR to and from the ground? That's a question that, that I would love to get feedback uh, in the question and answer portion of this as, as we move through this. Next slide, please. Okay, some of the things that we've updated over the last year to 18 months. Chris and Brian talked about a few of these, uh, meaning the H122 and H123. Things that we've tried to do within the FAA, AFS 400 and AFS 200 got together and looked at the OPSPECs uh, and said, okay, what do we need to update? What do we need to do to transition to bring the helicopter to the 21st century? One of the things that airplanes were allowed to do that air helicopters weren't allowed to do was in the arena of alternate airports for IFR weather minimums. So we looked at our, what our counterparts were doing in the airplane world, and we mirrored that to the best of our capabilities in the uh, helicopter world. As Chris talked about uh, a little bit ago, helicopters are fuel critical at the time we take off. We don't have the fuel a lot of times to go somewhere and then go a longer distance um, to reach an alternate. It was not unusual for me in my airplane world to be filing to Philadelphia and have an alternate in Pittsburgh. We don't have that luxury in, in the helicopter world. The uh, H-122, which is the Special Instrument Procedures for Rotorcraft Operations, which authorizes you to do special instrument procedures, as Chris was uh, alluding to, um, that is your authorization to do that. But if we want to move to the next level, you have to have H-123, which is Class 1 navigation using area or long-range navigation uh, systems with wide area augmentation or WASP for Rotorcraft RMP 0.3. That is out there at the, this point. The first three you see on here, H105, H122, and H123 have all been updated and are published at this time and available. H110 and H111 have been completed on the FAA side as far as all of our writing is done. We have gotten comments on them, that is done. We are waiting for a publication date and that is estimated to be somewhere towards the end of November, 1st of December timeframe. That will be more in line with your CAT 2, CAT 3 procedures uh, when the aircraft uh, OEMs have them developed to that point. Some other things you can look to see coming out in um, December. We have made some changes to the AIM and the AIP, uh, more specifically 10-1-2, which is helicopter instrument approaches, 10-1-3, which is helicopter approach procedures to a VFR heliport. And we'll have a new section coming out this year uh, in December for departure procedures. Next slide, please. Some of the folks that, that I mentioned that are on the team. This is some of the other things that we are currently working with industry, with other FAA offices and OEMs across the board. We uh, have been looking at the weather project that was put into Alaska several years ago and some other places. We have now got a project that is going with a helicopter air ambulance, a couple of helicopter air ambulance operators in Mississippi and Michigan. We will continue to work that uh, project at least for the next 12 to 18 months before we'll have any data on that. A lot of us are working the 5G uh, radar altimeter interference issues. If you haven't heard about that, you haven't uh, read about that, I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to figure out how it will impact your operation, your individual aircraft, reach out to your OEMs and find out how it will affect them because it, it is a topic of, of pretty high magnitude for industry 
the FCC, the FAA, and uh, we are heavily engaged in it today. One of the things that just came out was brief to HSAC um, two weeks, a week and a half ago, we did a weather study in the Gulf of Mexico. We had a previously, we had previously done one in 2017 to use weather boxes in the Gulf of Mexico to allow for IFR operations. A, another study was just released, like I say, about a week and a half ago. We, the FAA, are currently evaluating that to see if and when we will be changing any advisory circulars, any uh, regulations or any orders that may allow us to enhance our operations in the Gulf of Mexico. The FAA as a whole, but we have members of the helicopter modernization team working with airports right now, looking at a new heliport design guide, um, trying to update the standards of that to make the heliport environment safer. We're also working with airports to come up with a airport data and information portal or ADA. A lot of folks with heliports, you'll know that they move around and the data becomes corrupted or it becomes old or it becomes useless. We're trying to turn that into more of a digital format to make it easier to reduce the touch points, to make it more readily available for those who need it, whether it be the four flights of the world or whether it be the instrument developers of the world. I just touched on a few of the H specs that we are currently working. We are currently working on updating the instrument criteria. I'll go into that more as we move through this. And the FAA, uh, as we have asked airlines and operators to do, to look through the lens of SMS, we are also doing that with our own processes today. So SMS is, is a vital tool that not only you as operators and, and pilots and all can use, but we also within the FAA can clean up our own processes by using SMS. There's projects out there today with enhanced vision systems. Uh, as you know, the airplane world has been using enhanced vision systems under FAR 1 correction under 91176 for several years. It doesn't really address helicopters. So we are now trying to develop a head-worn display system, uh, relatively similar to a HUD that you would see in a fixed wing aircraft. And that is an ongoing project as we move today. As we all know, the vertiports and the eVTOL aircraft, the electric aircraft of the future are, are kind of not the future anymore. Some of them have already been in, introduced to the FAA. So we are in the process of trying to develop a uh, vertiport standard. Um, we are working with industry and many support groups on trying to figure that out. And the last thing on this slide that I will talk about is we have been working for about a year, year and a half now at updating the instrument procedure handbook. You can anticipate that probably coming out mid year of 2022. Next hey, slide, Nolan. Nolan. Hey, I hate to do this to you, my friend, but uh, you, we still got another panelist and uh, probably not much time for Q&A. So if we get right. a expedite to help out Max. I can do that, boss. All right. Uh, the 7480, we talked about it a, a little bit ago. It's a cumbersome process, it has been in the past. What we're trying to do here is update that we, we now have what I referred to a few minutes ago as the ADA uh, that we're working with airports. If you're familiar with the old 5010, it was very cumbersome, wasn't heliport centric. We have now changed that and you can anticipate seeing a more heliport helicopter centric um, process for that. Next slide, please. Special instrument procedures, we've talked about it already, so I'll brush through this one pretty quick. What we have available to the helicopter world today is the Proceed Visually and the Proceed VFR. What we're trying to go to is a non-precision and a precision approach and departure to the landing surface. We are planning on putting a, a table that will tell how to do that and the criteria and the infrastructure needed will come out in the next heliport design guide. Next uh, slide, please. 
So what what's given us the catalyst to do a lot of this is Congress passed the bill, HR Bill 302, Section 314, and it's allowed us to reach in and, and work with other providers, work with industry, and given us the funding we need to do some of the changes, the changes from the VFR world that we're all used to, whether it be just straight VFR, a VFR heliport with procedures to do to it, to an IFR heliport uh, once we get that criteria established. Right now we are working with airports. I was personally on two heliports this week, uh, developing that, that standard, that survey standard and uh, more to come on that as, as it matures. Next slide, please. Okay, this is one of the big ones I wanted to talk about, the 826042, which is the United States standard for helicopter RNAV standards. We're in the process of trying to decommission that manual because it was predominantly to VFR heliports. It wasn't PBN based and it led us to stay in the legacy RNAV world. What we're trying to do by this is we're taking the pertinent stuff out of the 42B and we're transitioning that into other TERPs guidance into the point three, the point 19, the point 46 and 58. If we had more time, we would talk about those more in depth, but just know that we are actively trying to change the old legacy RNAV system to a more robust RMP world, as Chris and them just talked about, with the ability for RF turns um, and narrowing the, the, the TERP cells. That way we have a, a tighter area, less obstacles, more precise flying. Next slide, please. This is basically just a cover slide on everything that we've been through today. Um, reach out to me if you have any questions or comments about the process today. We can go into it a lot deeper. Next slide, please. This is some of the groups that we've already talked to. I put this slide up to let you know that the information is out there in more depth. Talk to those folks reach out to us within the FAA AFS 400, to me, Mike Webb, Gerald Polly, uh, AFS 200, Tom Luperspeck, AFS 800, Eddie Miller, and we will be happy to either present to your organization or talk to you as an individual on where we're going and what we're trying to accomplish. Next slide, please. That is all I have today. Uh, I will be on for the rest of the meeting. I will reach over and look into the Q&A and see if there's any questions that I can answer for you. Appreciate your time. And again, my condolences to Harold, HAI, Harold's family, HAI, and anybody who knew that great man. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you, Nolan. That was, uh, we hated to uh, push you along, uh, prod you along, uh, but we're just, uh, we know that we uh, have a set in time uh, limit. Uh, really grateful for all that information, though, and uh, if anybody does have questions, uh, we will try to uh, pass those along, possibly by email. We know we're going to run late. I'd like to now introduce uh, Max Gornish uh, and have him uh, bring his camera up and begin this presentation. Thank you, Dan, and Thanks, uh, every, everybody who's uh, given of their time to, to join us today for uh, this uh, very insightful uh, webinar. Um, I'll start by expressing condolences to, to Harold and to his family and to the whole HAI family. Um, certainly was not privileged to have ever met Harold, but uh, had an opportunity to read the statement that HAI put out uh, and um, you know the world has clearly lost a, a great aviator and, and a great man. Uh, additionally, Chris uh, Bauer, um, thank you for bringing uh, this opportunity to me to uh, kind of share with everybody how all of this ties together in the navigation database space. And hopefully everybody will be able to see my screen, um, 
And we'll talk about navigation databases and we'll do it on a very, very high level. So question number one is, what's included in a navigation database? So from Chris Bauer and Hughes, procedure designers, taking into account obstacle clearance, terrain to the end user, which is you, the pilots. What exactly is in a navigation database and how does it come to be? So here are some key features in data that you may see, whether you have a Garmin system, Aspen, uh, any other flight management system, perhaps even a, an electronic flight bag. You'll see airport heliport locations, instrument approaches, SIDS, STARS, airways controlled, and special use airspace, comm frequencies, runway helipad locations, in route and terminal waypoints, and there's more. So in, in the Garmin navigation database, which is available for uh, anybody that flies with Garmin equipment, you can see that it's fairly comprehensive and this is a US data set only while we do have coverage that extends beyond just the US into Canada, Latin America and South America as well. But for the US, for our purposes here, we've got nearly 6,000 heliports, over 6,400 helipads, over 350 helicopter instrument approach procedures and over 250 helicopter departure procedures. And below I've listed just in general for those that are also fixed wing pilots or perhaps uh, those that are interested in fixed wing, the, the coverage that we have with airports here in the US, which includes Alaska, Hawaii, and all US territories uh, in the Pacific. So the question really becomes, now we have all of this data in a navigation database, and how does that come to be? What's the process behind getting it in there? And it starts with a letter of acceptance, which is a certification given by the FAA, as well as um, the EAS, the European Aeronautical Association. Uh, here at home with the FAA, they hold by a standard called DO200. And DO200 is a set of criteria. And it's really a framework that those that process data and make it available for end users follow. It's a rigorous process. And the idea is keeping safety in mind. So when we're flying, whether in IFR or even in VFR, but especially in IFR, when we have no visual reference to the ground or to our surroundings, how can we as pilots feel comfortable that our aircraft or our helicopter is going to get where we hope it will get and get there safely? So it all starts with the Aeronautical Information Service, state uh, authorities, such as the FAA. Those can also include any military uh, offices, such as the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army, as well as people and companies like Hughes Aerospace, which holds a four, uh, 14 CFR Part 97 certification as authoritative procedure designers. And that gives them the opportunity and the ability to actually design procedures on behalf of the FAA for use in the national airspace system. So what we do is we get this data from the source. And that data is taken in by somebody who holds a type one letter of acceptance LOA from the FAA. These are your data providers. These are people that are taking data, they're analyzing data, they're processing data into a certified database. And through what's called a data quality requirement, they work with a type two LOA holder and the type two LOA are your FMS vendors and your manufacturers, such as Garmin. Garmin avionics hold a type two, they receive data from a type one that goes into their systems. And at the end of the day, though that type two data, that database is what you all use as an end user, whether it be when you're flying with the airlines, general aviation, military, an end user can be a flight planning application. It can be an electronic flight bag, such as Garmin Pilot, 
so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, this is the, the DO200 aeronautical data chain. So the question is, what are our responsibilities as type one and type two LOA providers to make sure that the data you're flying is reliable and safe? So number one is we have to deliver data on a 28 day air act cycle. And that data is based in coordination with data quality requirements as mandated by the FMS manufacturers. The data must be current, accurate, and complete. Data providers must make every effort to ensure accuracy through rigorous verification and validation processes. And each, whether it's a type one or a type two, each entity has its own set of verification and validation that is ultimately signed off on by, in our case here in the US, the FAA as the regulatory authority. We have to maintain a historical record of all of our information that's in the database. We have to maintain a system for handling errors, whether those errors are identified early on in the process on the data received from the respective aeronautical information service, or perhaps as an end user, when you're flying, whether you know, in your helicopter and you're going to land at any helipad or in while you're en route, you say, and you look at your database and say, wait a minute, what I see on my chart and what my database tells me, those don't line up. And that happens. And we have a process in place to deal with it, which is anything that we that is detected, whether it be internally or externally, has to be documented and resolved. At the end of the day, if we can't resolve any errors, if we find them ahead of time, then we may have to withhold the data all within the umbrella of safety being our top priority until we can work with the respective host country and make sure that we get any potential error or any potential discrepancy that is ultimately deemed safety critical resolved. When we do discover something after the data has been delivered and as you're flying, if we discover that it's our responsibility as an industry to issue a special notice, to notify you, the pilots, that there's an error in the data. So that way you, you understand and you're made aware that this data that you have may cause a safety of flight issue. The, that doesn't mean that it will. And specifically on the type two side, they have to ensure compatibility with specific airborne systems. And what that means is for each respective helicopter, whether it be um, a Sikorsky, Bell, et cetera, each manufacturer has its own design criteria and the systems have to be able to work with the design of the helicopter. So as you can see already, a lot goes into making sure that the database that you have in your aircraft that you're flying with is something that you can rely on and trust to keep you safe. To add on to that, as Chris, as you talked about earlier and, and touched on this, um, what exactly will we see in our navigation database, in our equipment on the aircraft, and how does that sync and how does that correlate to perhaps what we see on our paper charts that we're flying with. So here's an example of the display. This is a, a Garmin GTN XI navigator. And I've, I've uh, put it up next to a Copter RNAV GPS. And what you can see is that the Procedure design in the visual display over here mimics and looks exactly like what you see on the chart. It gives you a visual representation in the cockpit without looking at the chart, which enhances situational awareness. Certainly if you're in the, in the soup in the clouds and you can't see. Over here on the left, you'll see, and, and I've selected the tag, tag transition here, you'll see the sequence of waypoints that as you're flying and on the specified track that you're flying on, you'll see where you're supposed to be 
at what time and in what location? Flipping gears, once you load and activate the approach in your aircraft, you'll be able to see step-by-step step what waypoint and fix you're at, how far you have to go, and, and you'll have to excuse the uh, 482 nautical miles. Uh, this is a demo. I didn't have the aircraft centered, perhaps where we would be coming from necessarily. But beyond TAG, once you get to Cool and Augen, and you, you can see here that each fix is designated as an instant initial approach fix, Augen being the final approach fix, and you'll see the, the hard barred altitudes here that correlate to the altitudes depicted on the chart, you'll be able to see that the navigation database really mimics and guides and is hand-holding the aircraft all the way down to the missed approach point and then executes the missed approach procedure so that if you fail the first time, perhaps you can try again. And that's all displayed here in the second box here, you'll see the missed approach altitude, which correlates directly to the lowest MDA on the chart, which in this case, this particular procedure has LPV minima. So it's got the most precise um, lateral and vertical guidance that you can have on the copter RNAV GPS procedure. And the same thing holds true with the departure with a SID. Th this one happens to be a very basic SID. Uh, out of the same air, uh, same heliport CA-37. But as you can see, all of the waypoints and fixes that are depicted here on the chart are also shown in the navigation database. And again, if you load and you activate the departure, you'll be able to see, and really in, live, in, in real time, you'll see these distances tick down until you reach that fix and then the system transitions on to the next phase. So hopefully try to, trying to tie this all together and being mindful of the, of the time, why is a navigation database important? Why is it something that's important to have for all pilots, whether you're flying IFR or even VFR? So the traditional and non-traditional uses, as you see here, detail using it in the flight management system. It can be used for flight planning, simulation testing, experimental aircraft, and there's a whole host of other applications to it. I know, you know, Chris, uh, you design procedures and you want to know, well, how do I know that that procedure is going to be safe in an aircraft? Well, when we go and we go ahead and get that into a navigation database, you can load that into your aircraft and you can fly it and report back and say, you know what, the procedure I designed checked out or the procedure I designed failed and here's where it failed and then we can fix it and test it again. So there are a multitude of different uses and you know, it really creates and makes a, a navigation database valuable. And as we spoke about IFR and VFR use, um, it can be used to navigate in a flight plan. Everything that you need is at your fingertips within the system in the navigation database. All the waypoints, all the nav aids, airways, um, so you can get from point A to point B. If you have a working autopilot, you have autopilot integration. So you've got your database there, you've got your procedures in your database, and your autopilot communicates with that database, your aircraft flies itself. I know I've, I've done it personally, uh, and it flies it flawlessly. And that really is a testament to the rigors of verification and validation that we do on a cycle to cycle basis to ensure that the, the ultimate standard of safety is, is upheld. And especially on the Garmin side, recently we launched um, as part of our autonomy suite, auto land and smart glide capability, which isn't available to helicopters yet, but it's really the first of its kind for general aviation, where if uh, an unfortunate situation arises and a pilot becomes incapacitated and a passenger who's not a pilot at all and is along for the ride, uh, what do they do? They can hit a button and the airplane will literally land itself. And that's because of the navigation database that's installed in the aircraft. Additionally, um, situational awareness, whether it's IFR and especially with VFR pilots. A VFR pilot, you're used to looking out the window and you're used to looking for railroad tracks, power lines, 
bodies of water to identify how am I getting from point A to point B? Or even if you're flying in the area, you know, how do I know whether or not I'm going to penetrate the airspace, whether it be a class Bravo, class Charlie? All of that is depicted on the FMS and in the avionics display, whether it be a flight display or even a robust navigator. You'll be able to see a pink line that shows if you're going from point A to point B, am I on the right course or am I off the right course? And that's not to say that if you're flying VFR, you should keep your head focused inside the cockpit. Absolutely not. You have to be out uh, seeing and avoid. But that being said, this is a tool and, a, and really a necessary tool to, to enhance aviation safety throughout the industry. Uh, I had the experience this year of going up to Oshkosh, Wisconsin for AirVenture. And I was really amazed at how many pilots had a database that was out of currency. And the dangers behind that is, is that aeronautical data is changing daily. Runways are being upnumbered, runway idents are being changed, waypoints are being removed, uh, airport idents are being changed, procedures are being removed, procedures are being added. So having a current database is really crucial, I think, to keeping the safest cockpit that you could possibly have. With that being said, uh, certainly if there are any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. And I wanna go ahead and again, thank you for your attention and your time today to, to Chris and to Dan and, and to James at uh, HAI. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, well, thank you, Max. And now uh, I'd like to invite Nolan and Brian and uh, Chris and Chris to bring their cameras up. This has been one of the most uh, educational and information packed webinars we've had in a long time. So I don't think we're gonna have a lot of time for questions, but Chris, I'll, uh, Chris Hill, I'll let you take it away. All right, thanks, Dan. And uh, hey, great, great job panelists today. You packed a lot of information into a short amount of time. We're beating you over the head with a, a, a pot pan or whatever, you know, trying to get you to speed up. Nolan, sorry, we did that to you. Clearly it shows that it, a lot more a lot more opportunities to share this information. So Chris, I'm gonna to go to you real fast just to assure folks of the plan. We, we, we certainly have you on tap for a follow-up webinar based on the interest here today. We still have over 90 people tuned in and the rest hopefully will tune into the recording to get their information, but uh, we'll have a follow-up webinar, but just real briefly, tell us about your plans for HAI Heli Expo in Dallas on what you're planning on doing a continuation of this type of information. Got gotcha, you muted there. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, pilots, we can't operate cell phones or um, copy machines or anything on our own. The, uh, the plan for HAI is to put together uh, a chart for the routes that the aircraft will be flying to and from HAI. I think there's two routes this year for non-experimental and experimental aircraft that we'll collaborate with you on. And we can make it available inside the, uh, the Hughes app and geo-reference it to have own ship display. We also plan on deploying the uh, weather camera system and advisory weather. So aircraft uh, that are gonna be participating at Heli Expo can avail themselves of that safety feature and being able to decide whether they wanna make a go-no-go -no -go decision on the weather and what the environment around it looks like and we'll have one on display at our booth along with our uh, flight inspection helicopter. You plan on doing a chart clinic uh, as a rotor safety challenge as well, is that correct? Or is that still in the works planning wise? No, we, uh, we very much appreciate the invitation to provide a chart clinic. I think um, anytime you could get that time with, with uh, Mr. Barabee, is uh, it, it's like going to a, a chiropractor and getting an adjustment. You, you walk away from it feeling a whole lot more limber and, uh, and assured. And I think we have a, a, a challenge on copter IFR so we could dive into some of these questions that we're getting about technology, criteria, regulata regulation, and such. Yeah, so uh, just for all of you tuning in who asked a question, I know some really great questions are out there. Take a look and make sure that it got answered in the chat. I know our panelists here are still digging through those and trying to answer some of those 
for you. Uh, we will not have time to get to all those questions here today, unfortunately, um, but we will copy their answers to these questions and post that as a supplement to this webinar. We'll also probably be breaking this webinar presentation of the recording into the three distinct parts from our panelists today to ensure that uh, folks who are tuning in and looking for a specific segment of this uh, presentation can drill right into that or break it into three uh, pieces uh, over their time at their, at their pleasure. Uh, but let's just ask the one question that seems the most prominent, um, uh, whoever among your panel, uh, the question about the Northeast and the challenges of instrument flying and, you know, uh, ideas about getting uh, routes out to Long Island and some of the challenges of going from VFR to IFR. Uh, let's just make sure that, that we hit that one in a, a succinct manner, since that seemed to be one of the more prominent questions that flew in today. Nolan, you want to take the first crack at it? Yeah, I'll start with that one. Right now, the FAA is in the process of a, we, we're calling it a process project. We are developing uh, ZK routes up in the Northeast right now. We're wanting to use that project to take, to develop a process on how to develop those, how to work with operators on how to do that, how to not only get the flight standards portion in, but the flight check portion in, the air traffic portion in, and we're reaching the end of that project as we speak. With that, we will, we're hoping to move uh, ZK routes and other types of routing and RMP procedures to the rest of the nation. So I, I don't know of any specific projects right now in the New York area, but I do know that we are wrapping up on the, uh, the Northeast project that we've been doing, and there will be other routes coming. Uh, I do know that there's some uh, other providers out there that are building some of these at the time. And uh, we, 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 the FAA, are very excited about the project and, and getting some of these put in other places. Now you're muted, Chris. Good catch. Chris Hill. All right. So, um... Chris Bauer, let me just, to, to, you've been looking at all the questions coming in. Uh, choose your adventure. Pick a question in there you thought was the most compelling and interesting that you got in today that you think is the most important that the people listening in, those 90 people that are still tuned in, what would you like them to hear about the questions coming in? Um, if you know what you need and you can't get it either because of budgetary restrictions within the government or reach out to us. Let us take a look at what your, your challenge is and see if there's an alternative solution that could be um, deployed to satisfy your, your requirements. And they seem to run the gamut between challenges with LOAs, accessibility to airspace, not having the routes that they need, um, and maybe creating an ecosystem that's not just by one operator, but something that could be shared. I mean, one difference about us as an entity at Hughes is we're, we're the only public Part 97 service provider. And there's no reason why we can't produce something as a public that could be spread among multiple users instead of just to you know, one particular proponent. So that's my, uh, my thought. Okay, thanks for that, Chris. Um, all right, so we're, we're going to do what we typically do when we close out a webinar uh, with our panelists is we ask them that one question. So just a real quick lightning round. We'll start with you, uh, Brian. If there's only one thing you want folks to take away from your part of the presentation, what do you want to stick in their mind as we uh, close out today? Terps is, um, although confusing and may put Chris to sleep, your friend. It provides you a layer of protection and that's really what it's all about. We're certifying safety by doing TERPs. Um, trying to fly to locations uh, in sketchy weather um, is not the answer. The answer is to fly IFR. Um, get IFR rated, get IFR equipped, have IFR approaches. All right, perfect, Brian, thank you for that. Max, I'll punt it over to you uh, from your perspective over there at Garmin. What's the one key takeaway from you? The, the key takeaway for me is to piggyback on Brian with all the, the Terps work that they do that we that can't come to life without a navigation database and really that's the opportunity for you as pilots to go out and it's it's not a lot of money 
annually, um, but we'll pay you back handsomely for if you ever get stuck. And I would encourage you, especially if you have Garmin equipment, go on to flygarmin.com, take a look at the uh, navigation database options there to purchase, and go ahead and equip yourself and, and keep yourselves safe in the cockpit. And as the industry grows and as the industry innovates, um, we're right there with it to make sure that that innovation goes to you, the pilots in the cockpit. Awesome. Thanks for that, Max. And thanks to Garmin for your support. Okay, Nolan, a message from you. Take away. I will tie right into Brian and Max in the aspect that IFR flying, planned IFR flying, not inadvertent IMC, but planned IFR flying is some of the safest flying you can do. When you're a properly trained pilot in a properly equipped aircraft with a plan, somebody gives you a departure and en route an approach to landing that has been turped and laid out with minimums. It takes the obstacles out of the way and it gives you somebody to talk to throughout the flight. Support IFR, we're trying to do that within the FAA right now with the updates I tried to share today. And I look forward to the, the IFR, the helicopter world of, uh, of the coming years. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Thanks, Noel, appreciate that. All right, Chris, you helped us set a world record on the longest webinar at HAI, so congratulations. Uh, lots of good information to pack in there. What's one key takeaway you'd like to leave folks with before we turn it back over to Dan? Um, I wanna thank you um, for your vision of, uh, of putting this together and the safety aspects that it provides. And I know it's a multi-headed nasty Medusa, but you've done a masterful job along with Dan and, and Jim at uh, encapsulating this for the audience. My, my last thought is just listening again to the people up in the Northeast you're hearing from us that you want to be safe, you want to be methodical, you want to do all these things. Your problem is really accessibility. You've got the aircraft, you've got the training, but you're not getting accessibility to the airspace. And um, I, I think it could be solved, but it, it's going to take a, it's going to take a team to uh, to do that. And if we can help you, let us know. Don't give up. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate that, Dan. I'm going to turn it over to you and those 88 people who are still hanging on, give them a great thank you for, for doing just that. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not sure who's more tenacious, the uh, presenters, panelists today, or the uh, audience who stuck with us uh, through this whole thing. Um, obviously, it's an important topic and it's something that we will definitely revisit. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much today. Brian, Max, Chris, and Nolan. Uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate uh, your contributing to the safety of our industry by offering uh, this uh, webinar this afternoon. Uh, from the, the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dan. And we look forward to seeing Thanks you all, all uh, again very, very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your time and tuning in. Okay, I uh, will finish up just a few uh, housekeeping things here real quick. Uh, hey, guess what's coming up? Monday. Uh, this coming Monday, the 25th, registration opens for HAI Heli Expo 2022 in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we hope you guys will join us. Um, obviously, there's going to be some great education courses there. Um, looking forward to uh, seeing everybody in Dallas uh, in next March. Uh, I'm sorry, Jim, did you have something? I apologize. Okay. No. Okay. Upcoming webinars uh, next week, save the date, October 21st, an aviation photography, uh, how to get the perfect shot. This is not only for the people who are riding the back with cameras, like me, it will also be for uh, a little bit of advice for uh, pilots as well. Um, aviation photography is a very skillful uh, occupation. And so we actually have three of the best people that I know uh, coming to talk with us about it. Ned Dawson from Heliops Magazine, Lynn Burks from Rotorcraft Pro Magazine, and Mike Reno from Vertical Magazine. Again, uh, three magazine publishers who built their magazines on their photography. It's going to be a really great one. And then on October 28th, we have How to Fly Neighborly in the Bell 206. This is one of the latest ones we have from our Fly Neighborly Committee. Uh, looking forward to uh, having uh, Julia back and talking about uh, how to fly 
more quietly, more neighborly in a, uh, a Dell 206. We will have a questionnaire coming to each of you very shortly. We do appreciate your feedback. Uh, we do look for titles and uh, subjects that you'd like to hear about. I think this was uh, mentioned more than once in the past. And so that's why we wanted to make sure we brought it. Um, tell us what worked, tell us what didn't work. And if there's anything that HAI can do to help you uh, in general, let us know that too. Um, the easiest way to do that is through the email address president at rotor.org. Jim sees all these emails and does uh, task our staff with uh, those as well. That does wrap us up for today, uh, for this week. We appreciate that you've stayed with us for so long. Uh, we're grateful for that. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Until then, fly safe, be safe, and we'll see you uh, next week. <laughs>